All right, in this session, we're going to talk about solutions. And I'm going to teach this a little different. I'm going to use some printed things for you because it'll make it a little easier for you as we go along. So we're going to talk about solutions. And this is not a huge topic, so this is not a very long video. But a couple of things you need to know. First thing you'll want to do is pause the video and write down what you see, and then I'll come back and explain it. All right, solutions. Now, the easiest way for me to teach solutions is what a solution is. So let's talk about today sweet tea. Because most of us drink sweet tea or know about sweet tea. So this will be a good example. Okay? To make sweet tea, you need tea and sugar. Now, all of us like different amounts of sugar in it, maybe very little at all. But let's talk sweet tea. All right? First of all, there are two parts of every solution. They're called the solvent and the solute, and you already have the definitions. Well, let's look at our example of sweet tea. If I have a solution, which is one thing mixed into something else, that's what sweet tea is, what is the solute and which is the solvent? Well, the solvent is the most abundant substance in the solution. Is there more sugar or is there more tea? Well, the solvent is going to be the tea. And the sugar is going to be the solute. Another way to say it is that the solute is what is being dissolved. What are you dissolving? And the solvent is doing the dissolving. So let's take another example real quick. Let's say that you're working on your car and you get grease on you. You're going to have to get that grease off your hands. Soap doesn't work very good. And so one of the fast ways to get it off is with gasoline. Now, it smells real bad, probably not the best option. But if you put gasoline on your hands, it'll take the grease off immediately. Well, that's a solution, one thing mixed into another. So which is the solute and which is the solvent? Think about it. Which is being dissolved and who is doing the dissolving? Well, that means gasoline is going to be the solvent. And grease is the solute. That's all there is to it. Now, they give you a definition here for homogeneous. I'm just going to go ahead and just put a line through that. They don't ask that word very often, so I'll just make your life easier, and we'll just take that word out. Now, whenever you have a solution, that means you're mi mixing things together. You can make things mix up faster. There are three methods to incre increase the rate of solution. So I'll give you a second to jot these down. Three ways that you can make something dissolve faster. Let's go back to the sweet tea. Well, we're going to dissolve sugar into tea. How can I make it dissolve faster? Well, if it's hot tea, heat it up, dissolves a lot faster. If you stir it up, that makes it dissolve faster. Or if you crush it up, let's think about it for example for a second. If I want sweet tea, which dissolves faster, sugar or sweet and low? Well, sweet and low does. Why? Smaller particles. So if I took regular sugar and I crushed it up into smaller parts, it would dissolve faster. These are the three ways to make something dissolve faster. Heat it up, crush it up, stir it up. Here's what a real example test question actually looks like that asks a question like that. You may be thinking, how do they ask that? Well, here it is. The question says, all of these can affect the rate at which a solid dissolves in water, except, well, let's find the things that do. Increasing the temperature of the water, it says except. Okay, so they're all going to do it. Well, it's not that answer because we know temperature does make it increase the rate. So they're looking for the thing that does not. Stirring actually makes it. Decreasing air pressure. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Or using larger crystals of the solid. Well, we don't know much about that one right there, but we know it's supposed to say using smaller crystals would affect it. Hmm, let's see. All of these can affect the rate at which. It doesn't say faster rate. 
So larger crystals would actually slow down. So we know that is actually affects the rate. This would be the answer. And so that would be the best answer. So sometimes when you answer some of the questions, you actually have to figure out what answers are true before you can find the exception to the rule. Very last thing I'm going to show you is what solubility sometimes look like looks like in a graph form. Here is an example of a solubility graph. You'll notice that you have each chemical listed next to the line that it goes with. It says temperatures in degrees Celsius, solubility grams in 100 grams of water. So we're taking each of these and we're dissolving them into 100 grams of water. I picked this question because they use this one a lot on the tax test, this picture. So let's see what the question asks. At what temperature do KBr and KNO3 have the same solubility? So it says at what temperature? All right. So that means that the lines for KBr and KNO3 are probably going to hit each other. Well, here's KNO3 and there's KBr. They hit each other right in that area. Well, let's see what temperature that is. The temperature is on the bottom. I slide over 20, 40, 60. If this is 40 and this is 60, 50 is right there, so that's 45. Let's go up that line. 50. It's before that, so it's between 45 and 50. There's my answer. Let me do that one more time. If they're going to have the same solubility, they're going to be at the same place. So that means that line and that line are going to hit each other. So in that circle is where it's going to happen. 40 goes to right there. 60 goes to right there. When I go up the 50 line, where they intersect, which is that point right there, the 50 line, that's it's going to be before the 50 line. And the only answer that's before 50 is 48. That's the closest one. This is how they'll ask. Let's say that they ask you a question like this. What is the solubility of KBr at 100 degrees Celsius? All you have to do is slide over to 100 degrees Celsius. What is the solubility? Go up the line. Where does it hit the KBr line? Right there. That is 100. That's 110. So it's barely over 100. It's not halfway. It'd be about 103 grams. How do I know it's grams? Because it says right there it's grams. So I just find the answer 103. Let me do one more. If I asked you what is the solubility, I actually I said the question wrong, at a solubility of 160 grams, where is KNO3? At a solubility of 160 grams, where is KNO3? Find the line, 160 hits KNO3 right there. And so my answer is going to be 60, 70, 75. If I go up the 75 line, it's past 75. It's going to be between 75 and 80. It's at 77 degrees. So you can look up anything you want on a graph like this. Follow the lines carefully. Read the question carefully. This is how you deal with solubilities. And every once in a while, they ask a question about this on the tax test. So be very careful. You may have to rewind this video and watch it again to see how you get, if I got the answers right and how I got them. We're doing a great job.